Welcome to Heaping Spoonful, a twice monthly conversation with restaurateurs, chefs, growers, and others who have helped generate the legends associated with eateries across the Mid-South. The team at Benny Keith is proud to sponsor this adventure with the goal of preserving the stories that have helped cultivate an amazing food scene across the Mid-South. So kick back and enjoy a Heaping Spoonful. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Heaping Spoonful. Our goal with this podcast is to share the stories of the Mid-South's top chefs and restaurateurs with you, our listeners. I'm Kelly Bass, and I'm proud to be your host here on Heaping Spoonful. Covering the restaurant scene is something I've done for, God, I'm old, more than 40 years, believe it or not. Most of that was doing restaurant reviews for Little Rock, Arkansas, newspapers and magazines long before the internet was a thing long before anyone who gets on Yelp or TripAdvisor can be a restaurant critic. But now, thanks to the folks at Benny Keith Foods, I'm a podcaster. Today, I'm very happy to get the chance to visit with Andre Poirot, the executive chef at 42 Bar and Table, the excellent restaurant in the Clinton Presidential Center in downtown Little Rock. So welcome to Heaping Spoonful, Andre. Bonjour, Kitty. Ha! Ah, <laughs> oui, oui. <laughs> So, Andre, we're going to get around to your work at 42 Bar and Table in a bit, and you're doing great work there, and I just benefited from a fabulous Sunday brunch on my wedding anniversary just a couple of weeks ago. But with a career as long and rich as yours, it seems logical to take more of a chronological approach. So before we get started down that long road, I will tell listeners you have worked in restaurant kitchens for more than 40 years, including 18-plus in Little Rock, but more to come on that. Let's start the conversation in your hometown of La Bresse, France, a small town of about 4,000 in the mountains of northeastern France. France is obviously a food-focused culture. Was food and appreciation of good food a focus for you uh, and your family when you were growing up? Oh, yes. I mean, you know, it's just part of of the French culture anyway. Everything is around the... you know, around food, everything evolved around the food and the dinner table is important. Um, growing up, you know, we had like a Sunday meal and the Sunday meal was really important, like the family meal, basically. Right. So one o'clock, everybody has to be there. All my all my family had to be there around that. And, you know, my mother will cook some fabulous meal, uh, you know, always take requests and all depending of the season. And, you know, there's one thing uh, in France too is, you know, now when, when we see... Farmer's market here, you know, that's something when you go to France, and I know you've been, is you find the markets everywhere. Yeah. Uh, in my hometown, the markets was always on Sunday morning, and they will actually, they actually block the main street of the, of the town, you know, and you got all the vendors, so you got a bit of everything, but, you know, beautiful produce and meat and... Cheeses. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Cheeses, Breads. Oh, I know. I love just walking down the street in any town in France and just looking in the at the, at the markets, but also in the shop windows at the beautiful pastries and the the way they tie up the roasts and make everything so pretty. Oh, it's just it's it's you great. Know, I mean, I know it's kind of disappearing a little bit in France, but yeah, you had your your butcher, your you had your baker, you had your produce, you know, and it's all in a quarter. It's really small. I mean, if you think like you know, my my hometown. At the time when I was growing up, we had something like five baker, five butter chop, you know, for right. 4,000 people. Uh, you didn't have the supermarket, and you see now you get more supermarkets. So, you know, that kind of, there's a bit less now, but uh, even when you go to uh, to the supermarket, usually the supermarket, like with the bread, sell the bread, the local bread. And right. they had a system where, you know, the, this baker is this day and this baker is the next day and they rotate to the to the people. You go uh, you go to the seafood display and you look at it and you'll think, you know, uh, we're, we're a land lock where I come from. You know, it's not that much seafood. And, it's, uh, and uh, you look at the seafood, you want to buy the seafood. You know, like here when you, you go, to, I mean, I don't know, I go to Kroger and I look at the seafood and say, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> <You> right. <know? laughs> Sure, exactly. So, yeah, but you all, you're just more of a priority. So was your mother, uh, was she much of a cook herself? She she is. You know, she's still alive. 92 oh, good. years young. Oh, I, uh, I put it in the past tense. I shouldn't have done that. So, 92. Yeah. So, uh, you know, she's in retirement home now, so, so she doesn't cook anymore. But <clears throat> she actually 
uh, was a was a cook for the, the school cafeteria. Ah. And if you think about once again, you know, the French school cafeteria with what you find here is completely different. <laughs> I could I show bet. you. Uh, you know, uh, I got the Facebook page from my uh, from my hometown, and I see what's going on. And they actually published the school menu, and I'm looking at it. You know, I don't know if the kids here will, would eat what they what they're serving, but you know, you're gonna find like you know, choucroute, who's like sauerkraut. You know, that's right. uh, that's a dish really uh, from where we come from. You know, like. You mentioned my hometown. My hometown is really close to the Swiss border and the German border. So a lot of influences there. Yeah, about fifty miles away from from each uh, country, and so you, yeah, you got the whole a lot of influence. We have the same, exactly the same product that you know the German. It, you know, the only difference is the way we treat it. I always like to say, you know, I was born on the right side of the border. <laughs> you, no doubt. When it comes to uh, to food and sauces, you know, the French are so much more, it's much more delicate than than the the German. You know, German sauce, you think about gravy, something thick right. and all, and, and think about, uh, I would say, like Jewish food, you know, when you go to the French side, you know, it's so... So much more delicate when it comes to the food in there. So yeah, my my, my mother was was a so sc- the school uh, cook for for quite a few years, and then uh, she went and worked in the factory. So you know, I was pretty young uh, when I started kind of getting interest in cooking, and one of the reasons I started so. My mother had to work like one week. She'd work five in the morning till one in the afternoon, and the week after will be one in the afternoon till nine o'clock at night. Ah. Now, my father passed away when I was two, and I'm the youngest of five uh, boys. So, uh, wow. you know, four brothers. A lot of hungry people. Yeah, so she will, most of the time, she will prepare something <clears throat> for us to eat at night. But there was time, of course, where she didn't have time. And so, you know, uh, the brother is just a little bit older than me, just two years older than me. Always was, you know, he was okay with taking like a, a bowl of cafe au lait and some tartine, you know, French and right. French bread and butter and just dip it in there and that will be his dinner. I wasn't like that. I wanted something else. So I started to cook and the, the thing I love to make were crepes. Oh, who doesn't love crepes? So I, I start like at 10, you know, and making crepes and all, and uh, my, my mother really enjoyed it. She even bought me a pan, just like a special crepe pan, a yeah. high pan, you know, so you go. Uh, you know, she so always, she could eat them when she got home, when she was working oh, yeah, the later she, shift. She, she would smell that when, you know, she'd go up the stairs. We, we were living in a third floor uh, apartment, and she would smell that going up the <laughs> stairs. She'd say, okay, I know she'd it'd been cooking. My boy Andre is making me something. <laughs> well, the thing with crepes, too, they're so versatile. You can put anything and they can be sweet they can be savory you can make them well, i will do like you know do one with ham and uh, yeah. and an egg inside and some cheese and then after yeah. that you do the sweet one with you know uh nutella you know sure and, like, yeah i've, I've bought them on the on the streets but they weren't yours so so as a child you were cooking and primarily you liked to and also it was a way to make sure you had something to eat and then your family had better things to eat what did that lead to your first step into the culinary business or how did you how did you well, move in that direction um, there was uh, a building, like a mansion, just by uh, where I live, really close. And um, the owner decided to turn that in a small hotel. And I would call that a boutique hotel. Now, right. You know, it was maybe 12 rooms in there. But that was seasonal. You know, my, my hometown is seasonal. It's one of the biggest ski resorts. Because you were in the, the mountains. Area. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, the summertime, you got, like, what you can do in the mountain, like hiking and all this. So he will have a chef coming for the seasons, about three months. And he had that old chef in there, and they had that building at a beautiful kitchen. You know, that was really one of those uh, big, uh, big mansion. And uh, in the in the kitchen... They had uh, these copper pots over the, the hoods. Yeah, I've and, seen those hanging, right. You know, it, and always like looking there. But I started walking there and doing some odd jobs. So basically, you know, helping cutting the grass and uh, I even helped doing some of the laundry. I mean, to know, you know, what to do, just put them in. The, sure, the, well, hotels need I mean, whatever, laundry, right? Whatever I needed to do. But I always were 
was gravitating again back to the kitchen and the chef saw me. So he started to give me the job of cleaning those beautiful copper pots, okay. you know, and with no chemical, you know, the old way, flour, salt, and vinegar. And, and a little bit of elbow grease and work, the, right? Yeah, yeah, the elbow grease, and you have to do it almost every week. And, uh, you know, every time he was cooking, I would look over and see, hey, what is this? What is that? You know, and uh, I got my, my first taste of, of a lot of stuff, you know, one of the... Uh, the memory I have about eating something I never ate before was smoked salmon. And uh-huh. I ate the smoked salmon on pumpernickel bread with a little bit of butter and some capers. And that was kind of a revelation there. So, you know, it started to give me a little bit more and more to do. And that's why I say, okay, this is neat, you know. Sure. Kind of I enjoyed working in the kitchen. Um, so, you know, I help, of course, doing the dishes. Like was, uh, So I was about 14, 15. And uh, when I finish uh, high school, so in France, high school, we go to s- till you're 16 years old, and then you can choose if you want to continue. So at 16, you can go back to, you know, get your baccalaureate for another two years. It will be your, your high school diploma here in the state. But you can choose, actually, to go to a trade school if you're 16. So we start a lot earlier. Right, learning a skilled trade, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I was talking, you know, I wasn't sure, you know, you, you're 16, you don't know what you want to do exactly and anyway in life. And, but uh, talking with a, a family friends, you know, and tell me, but you love cooking. Why don't you go and train in cooking? So I actually applied as a really good uh, culinary school in the area. And uh, I applied, I was accepted. But then... Uh, there was a financial problem, even that in France, you know, the, the tuition was taken care of by the government. You still have all these o- other expenses. So, you know, that would have been a hardship on my mother. So I decided instead I find an apprenticeship in town. So I started an apprenticeship. In a, in a restaurant? In a restaurant. So that's where you walk actually in the kitchen with sure. a chef. And, you know, so I learned, you know, the in and out of, of a kitchen and knife skill and all. But... Um, after a year and a half, I realized I needed more. And I say, you know, the school uh, will be the best way to learn more because in culinary school, it's like hotel hospitality management. So you learn not only to cook, but you learn how to run a business and how sure. to run a kitchen and you learn about, you know, food costs and all this stuff. So uh, I said, you know, I want to go back to school. So I went back and reapplied to the school uh, to give you an idea about that school popularity is there was about a hundred spot for each year mm-hmm. for, for classes and there was about four hundred applicants. Okay, so, so one out have, of four, right. You have to go in front of a panel and explain why, you know, so they had first question, they say, Well you wanna go back now, you give or say I gave my spot last year because you know, financial reason. Now I wanna go back because, you know, I'm a better spot, but I wanna go back, I realize I need to learn more. And, uh, you know, I guess I make a good impression because I was accepted again. So, uh, But the financial it, issue was still there, right? It, it was there, but, you know, I decided that I say, well, why don't I go talk to my senator? That's and like I your realized, local representative? You know, local representative, and I say, I went and I, you know, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a letter and then he asked me to come and, and see him and uh, I talked to him, I explained my situation and uh, he was pretty impressed uh, for what I wanted to do and he said, let's see what I can do. Well, the result was is I got a full ride scholarship. Oh, so so he actually gave me, you know, find a, a scholarship to, uh, to pay for all the other expenses. That's great. Well, see, but you took the initiative to go seek out his help and... Uh Obviously, you already had a proven track record of, of for, a, for a young man your age of, of doing a lot of that work. So that's really cool. And before we move on, um, the, the culinary school where you went in that part of France also is where Denny Sayer went. For any of you all listening uh, have got a sense of the history of the food scene in Little Rock, Arkansas, Denny Sayer is a famed chef who came to Little Rock in the 1970s and built an amazing career here. So... <clears throat> You got to Little Rock 18 years ago, and Denny Sayers here. Is that when you first met him? Yeah. And I was, said, hey, I, where did you go to school? That's kind of funny. You know, I mean, you, of course, first you have 
being a chef and you know it's 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 a small community you know right. you interview a lot of of the people and we basically know each other and if we don't know each other we heard of uh, each other sure. and uh being so a chef and then a french guy so french chef is much smaller you know, number much smaller and you know when when i I first talked to Danny the first time I talked to him. I said, oh, where are you from? I said, well, from, you know, oh, you don't know. It's a small town. I said, oh, yes, I know. I said, where do you went to school? I said, well, I went to the school in Germany. Oh, me too. <laughs> I say, oh, man. And then, you know, we start to remember things. I say, we had the same instructor, you know. And, and here we are in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah, he said, he say, remember that 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 chef who will take the, the sheet pan out of the oven barehanded. <laughs> he will do that with a freshman, the first school, he will do that. So he will impress and everybody will say, oh, we better be careful, he's crazy. Yeah, this guy's crazy for <laughs> sure. Wow, so that that is interesting, uh, you know, a little bit of an aside. So when you got out of school, did you get a job in your area in a restaurant after you got out of school? So right after going out of school, um, I went in a town about 25 miles away. Uh, it was the, the kind of the main town. And um, a pastry shop there was actually renovated, and they were opening a restaurant beside the pastry shop. And uh, they asked me to come and walk there. So I walked with one chef. It was a really small kitchen. You know, there was only uh, two of us and, uh, and a steward, a dishwasher, and that, that was it. And uh, so I helped open the restaurant. It was Pretty successful, and the other stuff I like when uh, I work with the pastry shop is I was able to actually see what there was going on and help. You know, when we were busy, especially during the holiday, you know, they were doing their own chocolate, and you know, I remember, you know, enrobing the the chocolate. Uh, they had a special machine, and you have to do the little. Uh, stuff on, you know, you go to fork and. So, were you learning how to make chocolate, or did you already know? Uh, well, you. You know, you learn in school, but what you do it, you do it once. Yeah, right. You know, and it's not, you know, it's what the you same learn as in doing school, you shop, learn right. the stuff. You don't right. really learn how to do it. You develop that after that. It's the experience who come. So, you know, I will I will help with that. I will help do, like, some cake, especially, like, it's Christmas time, you know, the Yule logs, and there will well, be, like, kind of a— Expanding a, your, uh, your your breadth of your skills— and so, how long did you did you work at that at that restaurant? Uh, I worked there about a year. About a year, and then and, and then. Um, so one of my best friend, uh, I was with was from my hometown. But I was with him in school. So um, it's funny because he went to get his baccalaureate and realized that after a year and a half, said, "Well, that's not what I want to do. I really want to be a chef." You know, mm -hmm. you kind of fell to the pressure of his parents to go continue the school. But sure. His stuff wanted to, wanted to be a chef. So he decided to quit and we applied to the, the culinary school. And that's where we met again, you know, after I said, what the hell are you doing yeah, here? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so uh, we, we were really good. And he actually had uh, taken a job in London, in England. All right. And uh, he went to the Savoy Hotel in London. And uh, the Savoy Hotel is the hotel who was opened by Auguste Escoffier. Right. And if you're a little bit of a, a, a food uh, person, you know Escoffier was like kind of the grandfather of sure. the modern cuisine, modern French, French cuisine, cuisine, you right. know. Uh, he published the Guide Culinaire, and uh, he was in charge of opening the Savoy. So that was, he's the one who started the brigade system. So, you know, after the, the military and he did the same thing in, uh, in the kitchen. So, you know, when you had, you had the chef and then you had the sous chef and then you had the commie and then you had the chef de party, the commie and first commie, second commie, and then you get the, the apprentice. So, so your friend had gotten a job there. So he got me a job there. He said, you know, I said, why don't you come the chef? Will you want some French guy? There's not well, enough sense French with this coffee. So, yeah, right, yeah. You know, I packed my bag and crossed the channel and arrived in London. Uh, With perfect English skills, right? Oh, yes. You know, <laughs> like new three or four words. I say, yes, no, please, thank you. <laughs> we are the restroom. <laughs> yeah. So then you're at least you're in a kitchen where it's a French kitchen. So there was a French kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything was ordered in French. You know? So we have <laughs> that an helps. Right. They had an aboyeur, you know, the barker. So the aboyeur basically, the the wait staff will bring the the, the, the order to the aboyeur and he will 
he will call the uh, the order, and everybody you have to listen. There was by uh, by section, so like say the party, you know. And I was working in the uh, hot fish section. That means I will cook any kind of seafood and all the seafood. So you you listen to what he say, and then you know you had the apprentice, and you will call. So if it's like say a salmonier, I will uh, I will tell the apprentice go to the to the butcher and say I need a salt for meunier. So they will dress it, you know, ready to go for right. meunier. Bring it back, and then we cook it. And then after that, uh, a sous chef will be. Uh, at the pass, and you have to listen, and they will call the dish when ready to pick up. So you will send it to them, and you know they check if it's okay or not, or you know send, send it back out, right. to it. So uh, that was that was quite an experience. You know the menu change uh, twice a day. Wow. Uh, we have to walk, so we walk Escoffier uh, recipes, and uh, you know I will walk with. A small book was called uh, Repertoire de la Cuisine. It was basically the contents uh, guide culinaire. But it just tells you, you know, what's in it. So if you say, you know, I got a fish door, yeah, when you open and it tell you garnish with turned cucumber sauté in butter. Right. You know, meunier sauteed butter, garnish with... The, so... You know, we look at that, you know, we got the menu, bring it to us, we look at it, you know, we put an order to the storeroom for what we need, and, and uh, that, that was it. And, uh, wow. Uh, you know, the chef was actually, uh, Trumpetto was actually Italian, was speak several languages, you know, French was one of them, so that right. was nice. Uh, it, it, and it was like, you know, the god in the kitchen, if you, if, if we pass by, I mean, any time you were called, in the chef's office, there was two reasons. Or you got fired, or you got promoted. <laughs> that was the only time. <laughs> you had so to hope it was Everybody the... would look at it and say, oh, it's cold. Yeah. yeah, you come back with a smile. Or with a, <laughs> or with a frown. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, how long were you at the Savoy? Uh, a bit over a year or two. And uh, actually, I had to leave the Savoy because uh, I had to go back to France and serve in the army. You know, we had wow. conscription at the time. So you had to go and serve your time. So I have to serve my time, you know, I have to spend, they were asking you to spend a year. So uh, went back to France, uh, I was lucky not to, to be posted not too far from home. It's like Nancy, it was about uh, 80, 90 miles from my hometown. So uh, that was easier, I get some, to spend some time with, uh, with the family when right. I was there, so you know. So what was your, what were your duties when you were in the military? Well, guess what? You were in the kitchen. <laughs> They have to eat too, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, they look at your skill and like, it makes sense. You yeah. Know? And I was actually uh, in a commando training center. So ah. actually I'm commando trained, believe it or not. You know, yeah. I don't think I'm fit. That was the only time I was really fit <laughs> well, you're in, the in service. my life. You yeah. know? Uh, but I have to go and do all the, the, the training and all. But, you know, what was nice is that we have we had a lot more money than a regular uh Army Kazan, and then um, you, I was in charge not only of the feeding the the soldiers, but also also in charge of feeding the officer. So they got better food. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we had really good food. Yeah, and and I got you know uh, the the officer in charge of the whole operation was actually a field guy who got in an accident and then couldn't go back in the field. So he really, that wasn't his thing. He really didn't care about it. You know, it was, he had to bite his time. And uh, yeah. he realized, you know, the potential I had that I was really concerned and taking care of everything that uh, he promoted me. Like after two months on a job, he made sure I was promoted so I could run the kitchen. Because at the time, the, the chef technically was... Yeah. The senior guy, you know, and of right. course you had the uh, the promotion. I mean, being co so, I got promoted corporal and be, was in charge of the of the, the kitchen so and all. You, so you did a year there, and then did you go back to the Savoy, or I went back to England, but I didn't okay. go back to the Savoy at the time. Um, I arrived back in uh, in London, and I didn't have a job. I looked for a job, and uh, there is. Uh, a culinary association is a French culinary association, actually called ACF, not the American right. Association, but it was like Association Culinaire Française. And uh, 
I was part of that before, so I went there and I say, hey, you know, I'm back, I'm looking for a job. Mm -hmm. And the uh, actually the president of the association said, oh, I'm looking for a guy. Oh, so perfect. That was perfect. And that was uh, a small French restaurant, small French bistro, but that was actually a club. You know, I'm, uh, the English love clubs. Oh, yeah, you know? a little privilege. And so, yeah. you know, uh, it make them pay to be in the club and then we make them pay to for eat the food. Yeah. That was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you cooked for the club. And, uh, yeah, so uh, that was, like I say, typical French bistro food. And uh, we had, like, a, we were known to have a, a great uh, cheese board, I mean, cheese trolley, right. and people will come sometime just to eat that. You know, that's all sure. we'll eat for, for their Good dinner. French the cheeses, cheese. yeah. Uh, so that was that was really nice. And... At that time, uh, my friend came back and started working in uh, another restaurant who was situated in Covent Garden. So Covent Garden had been just uh, transformed from being uh, the warehouse, you know, the uh, the wholesale warehouse for the city of London and that was kind of in the middle and they needed to expand. So they actually moved outside of the city and this area was transformed in like an entertainment district. Sure. So it was really close to the to the uh, opera house in London, and that restaurant was just opening there. And he started to help open, and he asked me, I say, hey, we need help. We, we want you to come and, and walk. Uh, this was your same us. friend so, you went to culinary school? Yes, actually. Yeah. You, know, you follow we, him around? Uh, we just, you know, yeah. follow each other. Sure. Where we go, say, hey, Seems like a pretty good gig. So, actually, walked the restaurant name was Thomas de Quinces, uh, name after an uh, English author, and uh, we were really successful there. We, uh, after a bit over a year, we actually gained uh, one star Egon Srone. Oh, that's a big deal. You know, is the English Michelin. Uh, and, uh, you know, being close from the opera, we had like the early crowd and the late crowd. Right. Um, I always remember uh, having Placido Domingo oh, wow. playing, so singing at the opera, and they had, they were after the the opera. They had the small party, and he came, and he requested a crudité. So, being you know, we were kind of French food, French restaurant. Uh, you know, that's where the, the nouvelle cuisine was coming up. A lot of stuff where, like, with mousseline and all, you know, to this day I can do a mousseline in a Robocoop in five minutes. You know? <laughs> right. Um, and uh, so, you know, we think crudité in France are not what we call crudité. So it's in not in vegetables, or just a in bunch England. Of raw it's vegetables. more like veggies. I mean, more like salad. Okay. So if you right. do, you know, we season the salad and all. So we do like a beet salad and carrot salad, a cucumber salad, tomato salad. So that's what we did. And when we sent that, he said, What is that? I said, well, it was crudite. He said, No, that's not what I want. So no, that's, <laughs> that's how I found it was just he wanted crudite. He wanted just cut veggies. Carrots that's and so. celery and stuff. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. Now, so how, so what led you to leave uh, the, your Covent Garden restaurant? Uh, I was kind of, I wanted to go back and be a bit closer to my family. I was missing my family, and I said, you know, I want, I want to go back. So I actually went back to France and uh, walk, actually. So I said that, but then my friend, yes, you know, after that, just left a little bit after me and moved to uh, Bordeaux, so southwest of France. And uh, after a while, he said, well, why don't you come? to Bordeaux, and I said, well, why not? So, you know, yeah. I follow him again. Good there. food, good wine. And, country. Uh, was when, he working in a restaurant, or what was he doing there? He was working in a big brasserie, you know, one mm -hmm. of the biggest brasseries, but actually I didn't get to work with him. I arrived, and I found a job first in a small restaurant. I was uh, doing almost everything, you know, that was really nice. And then after a while, I got asked to work for uh, one of the biggest catering uh, business in the town of Bordeaux. So uh, I went there uh, basically as a sous chef and uh, I was in charge of uh, running the small, what we call the small catering, so up to 100 people. Oh, so you just know, private, just advanced people needed a caterer. And, you know, most of the 
most of the catering were, you know, they were all offsite. I mean, we have a small restaurant because we were based out of the convention center in Bordeaux. But um, I will do like that, go in the chateau. So you're talking about oh. old Bordeaux, you know, I will go to the chateau and they will have a room and then uh, kind of a pantry area in the back and I will set up there and, and feed them, do the dinner or reception, whatever it is, and they will serve their own wine. Ooh, so you yeah, know, so I, you're at a winery, yeah. I learned a lot about Bordeaux wine and I taste, I got a chance to taste a lot of, of Bordeaux Ooh, wine because yeah. most of the time when I finished feeding the people, I couldn't get out because that room was locked you know, I had to go to the people to get out back and, and pack and leave. So I, I will have that time. So I will ask the maître de chez, the guy who was in charge of the winery, basically say, hey, you want to eat? I'll feed you. And he will come and bring the wine and he say, oh, hey, here, try those. So I will get something like, you know, three or four different vintage and try the wine. So, you know, oh. I, I did uh, a, a lot of, of those wineries. I mean, I did Rothschild. I got the wow. chance to, uh, to go to Chateau de Cam. Uh, oh, man. And, you know, that's, I found out dreamy, dreamy deal, and, yeah. funny story is I found out doing, starting to do that, that once the bottle were open, they were open, they will charge them. We just have to keep the, the bottle to show the people, you know, the guests, this is what you, you've been drinking. So I learned to take a cubitana that's been like a plastic jug with me. And I will like, you know, the, bottle, the open bottle were there, I will fill that up with the wine, bring that back home and yeah. then back in bottle and drink that, you know, during the week or drinking really good Bordeaux. Oh, but my friend <laughs> always say, man, what is this wine? This is so good. Said, well, it better be good. <laughs> yeah. Is, you know. <laughs> so you were, you were, you, you'd feed the wine guy and the wine guy would provide you wine. That's, hey, that's fabulous. That's, what a great, that's always a good, why, why did you ever leave that? <laughs> <laughs> Golly. I, I was young, but you know, um, after a while, uh, I wanted to go to go back out. I wanted to travel. You know, always love to travel. Yeah. So I wanted to travel, and um, I was home visiting my home school, and uh, they had a, a restaurant open to the public for lunch, and I went there and started to talk to, uh, you know, the the professor, and then I started to talk to the dean, and they say, "What you up to?" I went, I'm walking there, but I, I really want to get to get back, you know, to travel again. And he said, oh, you know what? A friend of mine is an executive chef in a hotel in Bermuda and he's uh-huh. looking for people. He's in France right now. He's from Tours, Vouvray. Yes. And he okay. said, this is his number. Why don't you give him a call? So, of course, that's what I did. And I called uh, the chef and uh, I think we hit it pretty right. And he said, well, you know, I, I'll be back in two weeks. I'll be back in Bermuda. I'm going to start to get HR to work on the paper. Can you send me this, all the information? So that's what I did. So I had to wait a little bit. It took about six months, actually, to get all the paperwork. But then I was um, able to uh, fly to Bermuda and uh, arrive in Bermuda. And uh, the hotel... Uh, I work for was the uh, still is the oldest hotel in Bermuda, the Princess, Princess right? Hotel. Yeah. You know the old oh, lady, yeah. the old pink lady in the arbor. Yeah, uh, that's that's amazing, and I'm I'm sure it's changed a lot since the '80s. When or what hasn't? But based on the website, it looks like a really luxurious experience. Um, a lot of different restaurants, and so. English is spoken in Bermuda. I guess you still had mm-hmm. decent English. You, you worked on English in London, right? You were still... Yeah, a- yeah. well, you know, and, and it's funny because, you know, when I start working in the kitchen in London, I work with... French. London, I yeah. French people, but I work with a lot of Cockneys. Ah. So my first experience learning English was with Cockneys. So I spoke <laughs> Cockneys before I, spent, I, I actually spoke English. So even some of the English people couldn't understand you because you were speaking Cockney English. Yeah, well, you know, we had yeah. uh, one of the, the English professor from my home school, high school in, uh, in France, came and visit with some of the students, and we actually met in a pub, and we were, I was with uh, some of the cooks and the chef, and we're talking, and all at one time he turned to me and he said, what are they talking? I said, English, what else? He said, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> A different type of English. So you get to this amazing hotel in Bermuda, um, again, just jumped into the kitchen, and was it, was it, what kind of cuisine? Was it French cuisine, or was so, it? So, 
like you said, the restaurant now changed. You know, they had uh, they have more restaurants now. But at the time, you had a main restaurant. You know, most of the people at the time, uh, you know, most of clientele is American, by the way, but they had the MOP, Modified American Plan, it was where you have breakfast and one meal included right. with your room. So they had a main restaurant, and then they had a French restaurant called the Ti- Tiara Room, and then uh, an Italian restaurant down by the pool. And uh, I was hired to actually as a sous chef to uh, for the, the French restaurant. Well, I told you it took six months to to do the paper. By the time I arrived, you know, I arrived the first day and I kind of introduced myself and I saw like um, a captain and uh, wait staff and told me, oh, you're the new chef. And I said, no, I'm just the sous chef. He said, no, you're the new chef. I said, well, what? I don't know. Then I, I go meet the, the chef and the, the executive chef and the executive said, oh, by the way, the chef left. So... You're the, the guy now. So I got a promotion <laughs> before even Never starting. Stopped. That's great. So that was, yeah, once again, that was a classic French restaurant, you know. Uh, when I was looking at, you know, Jack and Suzanne menus, basically what we were serving at our room at the time, you know, 1980s, yeah. that was the, the the thing going on. Thing you you were, know, things you were very comfortable preparing. I mean, yeah, yeah. and then. You know, table side service with right. having a Chateau Bouillon, a rack of flambe, and flambe, and all this. So oh. uh, that was um, really then um, the company decided to close that restaurant. You know, the, the time were shifting; the people were going less and less to the to the MAP, and they decided to uh, to change the restaurant. And uh, they changed the the one the, the Italian restaurant too, and. At that time, uh, the chef asked me, I said, hey, you know, you're there. The chef garde manger just left. You know, do you mind running the, the garde manger shop for a while? And that was the, one of the big part of it. So I said, no, no problem. I love to. I learn again. You know, at that time in the hotel, we actually had a, uh, an artist on hand. That's mean that the guy who will do all the ice carving, all the butter oh, sculpture, wow. everything. He had the decoration you put on buffet or whatever. This guy, that's that was his job. <laughs> Golly, that's so you luxurious. know. I got a chance to walk with him and learn about ice sculpture and butter sculpture and do all kind of stuff like that, you know. And I was there. Uh, they had a fair, a little bit like the state fair here, where they had a big culinary competition. So that I got all the hotel, restaurant. I mean, that was the stuff like you wanted to win that, and uh, I participated uh, a couple of. Of years and uh, end up winning two gold medals. Oh, great! Uh, so that was, you know, that was always proud to do that. Sure. And, and one of them, I have to thank that guy because he showed me, and you know, there was one was a, a cold fish presentation, and I had a salmon, and I made like a, a bouquet of flower on the salmon, and then I had like pieces, the dawn of salmon on the side, and on each one he had the different flowers I used in the bouquet. So you learned it from the art uh, guy, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, you <laughs> learn a lot when it's... You know. So you, <clears throat> Bermuda's a different sort of place, I mean, very expensive and very exclusive, and this hotel proves that. So you were there six years, did you like the living there part, other than uh, the work part? Uh, yes, I mean, actually, you know, uh, it, it was really nice, you know, but it's it's really small group of island, so... You know, we talk about island fever, and uh, that happened after a while. But, I mean, the first time I didn't go back home till about a year and a half after I arrived. Uh, now, at the end of six years, I say, you know, I'm starting to get tired. It's always the same. And, you know, it's it's basically paradise, but, you know, if you, have, you go to the beach and you play golf. Right. That's and other than that, the, yeah. Uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, it sounds like paradise for a lot of people, but after a while, it gets old. So sure. um, I, I wanted to to move again, and we were close to the to the United States. And I say, you know, I would love to go and walk in the United States. So now, you know, once again, you know, the, everybody know everybody. Small islands like the town here. And uh, I was talking with uh, with a chef who worked for Sonesta Hotel, who had a Sonesta there, and he told me, he said, oh, you know. The Royal Sonesta in New Orleans is looking for a chef de cuisine for their gourmet restaurant. Uh, they've been renovating and they're looking for somebody to uh, to run the uh. restaurant. So he put me in touch with uh, the people, and there was a French chef there. And 
after a couple of calls, then uh, started to get paperwork done. And the only way I could come to the United States at that time was with a J-1 visa, who was okay. some kind of student visa. But, you know... You not exactly like, a student, though. Well, it's it's to learn... You know, my, my stuff say, I want to learn Cajun and Creole cooking. Yes. So that was my side. You know, when I went to the consulate and they tell me, and uh, they were looking at how much they were paying me for a student, you know, basically, I say, well, you know, I go there to learn about Creole and Cajun cooking. So I yes. said, okay. Continuing education, for yeah. sure. And there you were. I mean, the Royal Sinesta is on Bourbon Street in the famed French Quarter of New Orleans. So you were right in the middle of the hot spot. And you were there for, oh, 15 years. 15 years. But, um, again, you, you, you got there on a visa, and visas don't last forever. Well, that visa are good usually to 12 months. Uh, you extend it to 18 months. But usually everybody do 18 months. You know, you right. get a couple of months so you can travel around and if you want to Have see the city. Too. But uh, when I arrive in, uh, in New Orleans, you know, uh, I actually met my wife, who was working at the hotel at that time, and okay. she was uh, an assistant manager in the oyster bar of the hotel. Ah. Uh, Desire oyster bar is right on Bourbon Street. Even to these days, you cannot miss it. You know, once you see the big sign "Desire," right? You know? uh, so uh, she was running that, and um, we starting dated pretty quickly. So uh, you know, we're dating. For about a year, and I, after a year, like I, I say, well, I need to go and find my next step because, I'm, you know, where do I going to go now? I need to find a kind of stay in the state. And she said, well, what will it take to uh, for you to stay? And I say, well, I don't know. There's the lottery, but, you know, it's almost, you know, the chances aren't uh, too good. Chances like, we're oh, good. I say all the other stuff is getting married. And then she looked at me and she said, well, <laughs> not very romantic. Yay, but, it <laughs> but you're still married. <laughs> That's been many years ago. So, yes. Yeah. So, you know, so you got married got and all married, of a sudden so you're an American citizen. And three kids later. Yeah, three, kids, <laughs> three girls later. Right? Yeah. Well, wow, that's great. So, God, you learned so much there. And, and so... At the Royal Sinesta, you didn't go. You didn't go there as the executive chef. What, what, did you take a little? I mean, tell us about so, your path there while you were there. So I was hired at the chef. The gourmet restaurant name was Begay's, and uh, when I first arrived, uh, you know they just had a uh, the food critic uh, from the local newspaper, yeah. the, the Times Picayune, and uh, they had giving them two beans out of uh, of five beans. So, you know, it's no stock was beans in New Orleans. So two. Two, two is not is good. not <laughs> very good, you know. Particularly in a place as that famous all. as that. So, uh, you know, that, that was, I mean, you know, that's the reason I was hired is to bring the quality back. And, and uh, so it, it took me about a year, year and a half to actually bring back uh, the quality of I'll say a year, but uh, a bit over after a year, um, I've got, uh, I was walking at night and uh, the maitre d' came and see me and say, hey, did the people at, at table 30 want to talk to you? And I say, okay, you know, and I go and meet these people. It was a four top and uh, Gentleman introduce himself. He say, "Hi, I'm Jean Borg." Well, Jean Borg was the name of the food critic, and oh, usually he always came anonymously. Sure, you know, it came before, and I say, I was first. I was surprised that he introduced himself. You know, right? What's going on? Blew his own. Car. And uh, he tell me, he say, "I will tell you, I'm really impressed with what you did to the restaurant, and uh, you know, you you really bought the stuff. You know, that's the uh, third time." In uh, in two months, and, oh, so he'd uh, done all his research. Yeah. He he was only introducing himself after his after work was, was done. done. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, "I'm really impressed, you know." And uh, I want to tell you how it is. You know, I usually don't do that. You know, I, I don't like people to know because after that, you know, he said, "I know people got picture. They can take a picture, and you know, every restaurant in town had a picture of a guy just like." Fuzzy right. picture of the guy, say if it's him or not, you don't know. <laughs> and he had a lot of influence, you know, especially sure. in a food town like New Orleans. Yeah, and in the in the that, but that was you know when when restaurant reviews and newspapers made a bigger deal than they do now. Yeah, so frankly. you know, it 
He said, you'll be pleased. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, the review was in the paper and we had four beans. Ah, you like doubled the beans. Beans. So yeah. that was, you know, Well, had you been able to, had you just put new things on the menu? How, to, how had you taken it up and how did you get the permission to do all of that? Well, you know, my general manager who became my mentor um, was Swiss German. who was Swiss German and at the background, he was a chef at the background. So, okay. uh the problem was at the time, once again, you know, 80, 89, so late 80s, um, the, the food movement was changing. The cuisine is always evolving no matter what, you know, but, you know, they were still stuck in the old way where, you know, the, the food on the plate, the, the vegetable on the side, everybody had the same stuff like the veggies and all. So I actually went to my, uh, my GM and I say, we need to change, we need to evolve and all. And uh, at first it was with the thing, you know, say, so, oh yeah, but this is so good. I say, yeah, but we're not dreaming with the time and it's time for a change. And uh, finally he, he agreed and, you know, to let me change it. So uh, I was able to, to change that. Uh, the other thing is uh, I had hired uh, my, uh, a sous chef was really excellent, you know, so we, we, we were perfect as a team. So, you know, we showed the, the thing, then when we got the uh, the newspaper article, the review, you know, that was like, okay, you know, now. Validation. The validation, yeah. yeah. So, you know, after that, the executive chef left, so uh, the GM learned, of course, that uh, I was getting married, so I was getting my green card, so uh, he asked me to to take the job as executive chef. It worked out great because my wife at the time was promoted to restaurant manager. So oh. you know, from working at night, we have to go now work daytime. So we basically had the same schedule, so it worked very well. And then uh, after a couple of months, the chef decided to leave. And of course, the GM offered me the executive chef position. So that was like I was 32 years old. So wow. I was pretty young to be in charge of a big kitchen like uh, that. At and you know, you, you, you learn a lot when it's like that. You know, I learned like when I was first starting as, as the chef, you know, I, I wanted to do everything myself. I didn't trust anybody. So sure. I was, you know, I was basically ruining myself, you know, burning myself out. And that's where, you know, my GM came and said, chef, you know, you cannot do everything. You have, to, you, you have to delegate, <laughs> right, you know, right. uh, one thing he told me, and that's something kind of a mantra, you know, it doesn't matter if you're here or not, you know, if stuff happen, it's going to happen anyway. Right. So you have to trust your people to be able to fix it and take care of it. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, as we tell your story or you tell your story, here you are, 32 years old, and getting to be executive chef at an incredible place like the Real Sinesta Hotel on Bourbon Street. The next chapter, going to Little Rock, Arkansas, just would not necessarily be what I was predicted. What what made you decide to leave New Orleans, and how did you find your way to Little Rock? Well, <clears throat> as you know, in New Orleans, you always had the threat of hurricane. Right. And at the time, we had Hurricane George who uh, just went through, and Hurricane George was almost as big as Katrina and was coming the same way, but the last minute kind of went way up to uh, Mississippi. So even that we talk uh, some of the the bad weather, you know, it wasn't as bad as, as Katrina, so we survived. But I've got to stay. I sent my wife and the kids to... Uh, you had kids other, by this point. Yeah. Yes. A brother to uh, to a brother in North Carolina, and I stay with the cat. So <laughs> yeah. stay at the hotel, and um, yeah, it was me and a couple of guys in the kitchen and my pastry chef at the time, and uh, we had to feed seven people for three days. We were in lockdown for three days. Uh, we weren't supposed to have that many people. There was a group of English people who were supposed to leave. By the time they tried to evacuate to the airport, there was about 300 of them. They got sent back to the hotel. The so you had to feed closed. 300 stranded English people. Yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> you know, that experience was was scary. And I'm thinking, you know, and after that, talking to one of my uh, wife, uh, Cousin who used to work for the the corp of engineer, and he told me, he said, Andre, if that 
hurricane comes straight to New Orleans, New Orleans is going to be underwater. There is nothing we can do about right. it, you know. And that makes me think about it. They say, well, maybe it's time to to change and move. There were things happening with the company too. You know, my GM was talking about retirement uh, stuff in the company. There was a new generation running the company. You know, Sonesta at the time was a family-owned uh, company. And uh, I didn't see, I didn't like the way the direction the, the company was going. And just talking with, against, you know, talking to somebody, uh, I had a friend in the Peabody in Memphis who told me that they were looking for an executive chef in Little Rock and say, okay, where is that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I say, well, I didn't know you had a Peabody, another Peabody in Little Rock. He said, no, nah, it's fairly new, you know, it, opened not too long ago, but they, they're looking for a chef. So once again, you know, get in contact with the people at the Peabody and uh, they flew me here in Little Rock and I interview and, you know, do a uh, dinner just for them, like a special, and uh, they offer me the job here. And, you know, went back home, I think, discuss it with my wife. And, you know, I told my wife, say, well, you know, I got that job in Little Rock and she <laughs> looked at me and said, Little Rock? For all the place you could go. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Not Bermuda, not Bordeaux, <laughs> but Little Rock. But, you know, I mean, the the, the Peabody, is, is the Marriott now, yeah. is a very nice hotel. You know, used very to be nice. the Excelsior. So, I mean, very nice hotel. You know, we had the duck and all. So, uh, yeah, the ducks for sure. So, yeah. we... Uh, this, I decided to take the job, and uh, I was quite surprised, you know, I mean... Same thing, you know, that, that, that kitchen didn't have any directions when I first arrived. They didn't have chef for six months, so uh, it took me a while to, to get it where I wanted. It's about two years, but, you know, from there, that was, that was pretty good. And Yeah, uh, that's cool. Well, listen, thanks, everybody, for listening today. We're going to take a short break here on Heaping Spoonful. We'll be back in just a bit with Andre Poirot, executive chef at 42 Bar and Table at the Clinton Presidential Center in downtown Little Rock. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Heaping Spoonful. We at Benny Keith Foods enjoy talking about the food scene almost as much as we enjoy providing the top quality ingredients that help restaurateurs and chefs across the Mid-South create their magic. Now let's dive even deeper into the culinary world with your host, Kelly Bass. Welcome back to Heaping Spoonful as we continue our conversation with Andre. So... You're in the Peabody, and how old are your children when you all moved to Little Rock? Uh, I think they were like 10, 8, and 6. Okay. So they, were still so they go into elementary school, and then you all become part of the... And I'm, I'm guessing by this point, your wife is being mom more than running any part of a restaurant. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, we had to make a decision when, when we had our first uh, kid is, you know, are you going back to school or a bit to work or... Take care Are of you kid. staying? And you know, one of us need to take care of the, sure. the children, especially in this business. Oh know? yeah, there's no time to be uh, a parent. <laughs> so uh, you know, I'm 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 really grateful for her to sure. to help and to, to decide to raise the basically to raise the kids. I mean, I was right. there, but not as much as I wanted to. Right. Uh, that's that's to give in uh, in our business. So yeah, so you're at the Peabody and you you're making great things happen. And it was a huge time for Little Rock when the Excelsior Hotel, then it's the largest in convention hotel in Little Rock, and the Peabody's a brand that everyone knows, that people from Little Rock love to go to Memphis and hang out in the lobby of the Peabody with that beautiful hotel in downtown. Um, but just like you didn't necessarily um, like all of the direction of, of the Sonesta, the, the family and the younger generation, the family running that, then all of a sudden, the folks who ran the Peabody sold it. And I'm guessing that um, when, when a it became a Marriott in 2013, and I guess that, by nature, was the end of your time there. Well, yes, you know, it is. When a new company come, most of the senior management is let go. Sure. And, uh, I mean, that wasn't a surprise. Uh, you know, we had a good stuff. I mean, you know, uh, Peabody uh, at the time made some bad decision. They had a hotel in, in Orlando, and they decided uh, there's a 900-room hotel. They decided to double the size, uh, went to overrun the budget and 
find themselves short of cash, so the cash flow, and that's why they start to sell other hotels. They had more than, there was three people here at the time, but they had another six or seven hotels. The Hilton here uh, was one of them. Okay. And uh, so they start to sell all these hotels, and at the end, they couldn't sustain it. They sold the hotel here, and then they end up selling the hotel in Orlando. So the only one left at, at this time is the Memphis. original one. Uh, right. in Memphis. So when you were done, you know, you knew it was your time was over at the Peabody. Did, were you committed to staying in Little Rock or did you reach out and see what other opportunities you might have? Well, I, I, I wanted to stay in Little Rock, but at the time I couldn't find anything. And uh, actually I was talking to quite a few people. I talk about going back to New Orleans. Uh, I interviewed for a few spots there and then uh, actually interviewed with uh, – hotel in Nashville. At the time, Nashville was really starting to move and right. actually had two jobs in Nashville. So uh, I was ready to make my decision for one of those hotels in Nashville when uh, the Allens, uh, who owned the Crown Plaza at the time uh, on Shackleford, uh, contacted me and said, hey, we want to talk to you. We would love for you to come and work for us uh, and say, can you talk to the general manager? I said, sure. So uh, I went and talked to the general manager and, uh, you know, the first thing I told him, I say, you know, before we start anything and talk, you know, you have to understand I'm not cheap. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he said, well, what are you looking for? Let's look at it. And uh, after talking, he said, I think we can make it work. So, uh you know, that's the way we, we made the yeah. deal. And uh, I went and worked for the Crown. And, uh, you know, same thing. I think uh, I elevated what the Crown Plaza was at for the sure. time. And uh, it, it worked out pretty good. That was that was a nice nice people to work, sure. to work for. Well, those listening who don't know the, the Little Rock restaurant and or hotel scene, the Allen family, uh, Wally Allen, his son Blair, and there may be more of them, but that's the two I know. Very well known here. In fact, Wally Allen's such a big deal in the in the hospitality world here that the the Wally Allen Ballroom in the, uh, the Little Rock Convention Center is uh, is bears his name. But but again, you're working for a, a family that owns a hotel, and so um, you definitely elevated the cuisine there, made it more of a of, of a go to spot for for locals and for guests of the hotel and travelers to Little Rock. And then they decided to get out I of sell. that. Yeah, you know, I said I have to be careful where I go yeah. next. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but where you went next um, was to the Capitol Hotel. What is, is the banquet chef? And the Capitol Hotel is owned by the Stevens family, and the Stevens family uh, headquarters is across the street from the his historic and magnificent Capitol Hotel. And they have the largest uh, brokerage house off of Wall Street. So they're a very uh, successful and wealthy uh, financial firm. So you don't probably have to worry about the Capitol being sold. And so you get to the Capitol and uh, – Lo and behold, all the chefs there are French. Oh, yeah. Or the, the, reason, oh, the management. Yeah. The reason, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, my friend Alain was the food and beverage manager there, used to be the food and beverage manager at the Peabody, and actually okay. moved to the Capitol across the street. Ah. The hotel was So you'd sold. worked together before. <clears throat> the uh, executive chef, uh, Joel Antunes, mm -hmm. you know, was very well known. Uh, uh, so I I know him too in fact. So when that opening came, you know, Alan called me and and uh, asked me, say, are you interested? I say, sure. I will always love to work at the Capitol Hotel, and uh, you know, I say, do I have free end with the food in uh, in in the banquet department or in in room dining like they call it there? Yeah. Uh, and he say, yes, you know, uh, Joel is fine. If only one is concentrate on a restaurant, you have you can do whatever you want with your department. So that was perfect. Plus I end up helping him in a restaurant too, you know, and when he went on vacation, I will run the restaurant. Uh, I will uh, help to uh, with the breakfast. He didn't want to do much with the breakfast. You know, at the time, uh, the chef uh, for breakfast uh, was James, James Ailes. Yes, yeah. So, I know, you know who's, done, who's James, done great things since then. James from his restaurant from Acadia. Yeah. So, I mean, we we had a really great team. You know, Mark Gisol, uh, was mm -hmm. in charge of the the grill. So you know, it's an all star team. It was yeah, yeah that really, really yeah. all star team. So, but you know, 
I stayed there almost a year and I really enjoyed it. But uh, the year, uh, Mike Seelig, who actually run the food and beverage department at the Clinton Library, uh, approached me, you know, gave me a call and said, could we meet? And and I uh, said, you're calling me? What do you need? Because yeah. you don't call me if you don't need anything. He said, oh, let's just have a cup of coffee. So we went to have a cup of coffee and he told me that his chef uh, was leaving and he wanted me to come and work at the library. And at first I said, well, you know, I'm happy at the Capital Hotel. I like what I'm doing right there. And he said, let's talk a bit more, you know, come and see what we talk. So, so we talk and all, and he convinced me to come and uh, to, to come and work at the library. Uh, and you had known him because he'd been a chef. And what it, was he a chef at the Excelsior before? He was a chef at the Excelsior, and then of course he had his own restaurant, Vermilion Water Grill, and Vermilion yeah. West Little Rock. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah. And you know, uh, we see eye to eye. We have the same philosophy when it comes to uh, running a restaurant and the food. I mean, it's it's really really easy when. You know, plus if you look at the layer of uh, people over you, I mean, basically it's me, it's him, you right. know, and then we have the people of the foundation who are like kind of a, an owner, basically. You know, of course we have President Clinton, but yes. he show up a couple of times a year. Uh, but, you know, those people don't know anything about food and beverage, so they rely on us, they trust us. Sure. You know, if we tell them this is what we want to do, they'll say, yes, sure, you know. It's only normal that we pass it by them, you know. It's just respectful, but uh, we don't have any issue with with the way we want to run the the, de- the department. Right. So it's it's really a- and it's a, it's a great restaurant. I mean, you know, but it, it's different in that it is housed in a presidential library. So you have a, you know, at lunch, of course, you have a built-in clientele of, of guests. It's also very popular with locals, mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> then you all have also um, really. Um, built up the brunch business, which is because you have lunch all five weekdays and you brunch on Saturday and Sunday. So it's seven day a week operation, but dinner is only Thursday through Saturday. So hopefully that at least gives a little bit of relief to having to be up there at night every single night, like you've done for 40 yeah. years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, I try and, uh, you know, now I'm here at night if we have catering business. Uh, I had a great crew. Uh, I had great people, you know, uh, Jason Morell used to uh, mm-hmm. work at Sonny Williams. He had his own restaurant, a starving artist cafe. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's my chef de cuisine. Uh, uh, my pastry chef is Jeremy Pittman, who used to own the pizzeria. Uh, I got uh, MJ Farr, who's my banquet chef, who, uh, who was really great. I mean, I really relied on her a lot uh, for everything. I mean, and uh, so we we have really same thing, great Great core of people there, you know, and uh, front of the house is the same, you know. Uh, we really see each other. So great team working together. Uh, you know, we saw that during the pandemics, you know, we were lucky uh, in 2020, tw- March 2020. So we closed, you know, when everybody was closing. Right. And uh, the day we were closing, uh, we were asked if we could do 500 uh, box lunches for kids in schools, kids, you know, because oh, wow. the school were getting uh, close. So a lot of, of those kids didn't have uh, anything to eat because they were relying, a lot of kids were relying on the school yes. cafeteria. And uh, so we started that. And then we partner with actually with World Central Kitchen, yes. Rosie Andres Charity. And you know, he's a good friend of President Clinton. So we partner and we're starting a feeding program. So from March up till September of that year, uh, we started by, like I say, 500. And then we start to do a 1,000. And then we start to do not only lunch, but we're starting to do dinner too. So hot meal at night. Oh, yeah. uh, we end up, like at the end, uh, we were doing about 7,500 meal a day. Oh, it's incredible. And, you know, uh, the logistic for it. At first, you know, when I say, you know, I arrive at certain, say, hey, my kitchen is only that big. I can't yeah. really do that much. And, I, you know, I, I surprised myself that we were able to do that much. Uh, we asked for volunteers. We were lucky, uh, you know, with all the 
different people were coming, you know, and, and volunteering that we, any given day there was about 50 people coming and helping. Uh, we had a good protocol in place, you know, everybody wearing masks and all. And, uh, and we were lucky we didn't have any case or anything. So during all that time, so uh, that, that was something. But yeah, we end up feeding about, doing about 750,000 meals. That's that unbelievable. Time. Yeah. You know, we use food truck. For right. Delivery, so. And I know other folks in the in the restaurant business who got involved because their restaurants were closed, so they were mm-hmm. trying to come help. Uh, and I've heard that's 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 an amazing amazing operation. So, looking at forty two bar and tables uh, menus, there's a there's an overlap between lunch, brunch, and dinner, but not a ton of it. I, but I, again, I I still see the SSS smoked salmon salad. That's got to be popular. Tell us about that. What's SSS come from? Well, smoked salmon salad. Oh, but duh. I, but duh I, sorry. But actually, it's named to after our executive uh, director, Stephanie Street. Ah, so, get so the S's you know, in there. SSS. Yeah. And yeah. That's her initial, too. So, yeah. you know, uh, it, it's a great salad. I mean, it's really popular. You know, when I came and, and the lunch menu didn't change much, you know, why do you want to change something that was working very well? Right. So we tweak it, but, you know, every so often. But uh, this stuff that we cannot take away, and one of them is that. Uh, the other one is the steak salad. To, uh, yeah. It's just a thing that, you know, we're changing it. Sure. And I see crab cakes pop up on each menu as well. And uh, and I had one when I was there. My wife actually did with her Benedict on our Sunday brunch. Um, tell tell our listeners what, what goes into those crab cakes. So that the crab cake recipe <clears throat> is something I developed actually in New Orleans. So I call it a New Orleans style uh, crab cake because I start, I made a, uh, a velouté with the, the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. Right. So it's, you know, bell pepper, onion, celery, and what makes it holy is the garlic. Ah, so yum. You learned something, see? The Trinity, then the holy, you add the garlic. Yeah, the garlic. <laughs> and um, so I make a really heavy velouté with trim stock and the Trinity, Cajun spices, and then uh, let it cook, cool it down, and then I fold a little bit of breadcrumb and the crab meat into it and make the crab cake. Yeah, well, they're they're superb. And, you know, I look at the dinner menu, which is quite diverse, but what kept, caught my eye is the uh, the seared lamb T-bone. So I'm not sure I've ever eaten or seen a lamb T-bone, but I guess obviously lambs have a T-bone. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, most of the people know about the rack of lamb, but if you go a bit lower than that, then you're going to have the T-bone. So it's, uh, they call it T-bone, they call it loin, loin right. chop, you know, uh, but it's really good. And, uh, you know, uh, with with COVID and, and the issue, like everybody going to tell you, you know, uh, well, the inflation and the, the, the supply chain issue, you know, it's all... So always looking and say, what can we get? Well, at what, what, what price point, you know? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, even that I raise my price a little bit, you cannot raise the price like it should be. It's just sure. no way, you know. You are about a price point, so you cannot break it. So, uh, you know, that, that's where I look at, at something different cut of meat and different way of doing it. Uh, but you know, this is a great a great product from uh, Homa Steak actually, uh, that I get from uh, from Benny Keith. Um, you know, I got uh, almost all my meat from Benny Keith uh, or burger, a whole uh, Angus black Angus, yeah, uh, ground meat. You know, that's what make a great burger. Well, I know, and you have a great mess. burger for sure. Don't make, you know, <laughs> don't mess with the meat. You know, keep yeah. it simple. Uh, right. That's cool. And then uh, on the brunch menu as well, and I, I uh, have to say we indulged in this, is the pull-apart monkey bread and the beignets. We had the monkey bread, which is a large amount of food. I guess just giving somebody something uh, before their main course comes that they can share. Mm-hmm. And and if you look at the menu, you say to share, you know. So yeah. we have the monkey bread, you know, a sweet dough, butter, brown sugar, pecan, cinnamon. Can't go wrong. No. And then the beignets, of course, you I mean you spent 15 years in New Orleans, and that's. I feel like, you know, I say, okay, we need to do something, and, and I, I love beignets. Um, and then we had breakfast fry because I said, that's easy, everything is there. So, yeah. you know, we do the sausage gravy, 
uh, bacon and then some cheese on there, melted cheese on it. So yeah. it's always, it's really popular. Well, you're, you're a French chef, but you certainly uh, know Southern cuisine because all between biscuits and gravy and all of the, you know, the eggs, eggs and stuff, you have a, gr- a great breakfast. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just, you're, you're doing great work there, period. Before we close on one more thing, I, I just I, struck me is that for a, a good number of years, you've been consulting with a group out of North Carolina, which I guess taps into a little bit of different side of your, of your brain and of your experience. Tell, how that, tell us what you do for that company. So uh, R&D Consulting, uh, it's a, a company, all my good friend of mine, Rick Perez, Chef Rick Perez, and he do some research and development. Um, when I started with him, he used to work from Genio and Dole, and do right. research, and then so Sun big Sweet. food companies, right? Yeah, and then Sun Sweet. So now he kind of uh, focuses himself on working for Sun Sweet or Plums. Yes, and prunes, you know everybody right. knows the Sun Sweet Plums and the prune juice, and that's it. But you know when you do those uh, those plums, there's a lot of byproducts. So what do you do with that? And basically, they hire him. Uh, starting to look at what can we do with this product that we have. So um, he found out that there's a lot of stuff we can. So a fresh plum juice uh, can be uh, used instead of phosphate when you freeze chicken breast. So oh. right now, you know, phosphate being a chemical. So when he started that 26, 28 years ago, uh, you know, he approached a big company and they were telling him, so, no, we, we're okay, you know, phosphate is cheap and nobody complained. But then about 10 years ago, you know, they start to shift and people start to look for clean label and they wanted clean label. So all of a sudden... Natural foods, have, right. Yeah, yeah, you know, and everything with the plum, it's all it's only 100% plum. So we find out, you know, okay, first with the phosphate, uh, find out, like, uh, if you use it in... Uh, uh, in, in protein or in, in meat, like I do sausage at work and I used a bit, you know, about 1% of, of uh, plum juice in there and that helped me reduce the amount of salt and spices and sugar. I don't use any sugar at all in my sausage. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I reduce the amount of sugar, uh, the salt I can put in there. I reduce the amount of uh, of spices and then we introduced that, we, we created uh, a a line of sauces too. Uh, so uh, now, you know, some of the plum paste are used in a uh, protein bar. Yeah. So, you know, this side is make me, like you say, you know, it's taking a product and, okay, what can we do? Let's try this. So, you know, we discuss it uh, with my friend and say, hey, do you want to try that? You know, we've been approached by this company uh, you know, about their product, they want to use our product. What can we do with it? You know, let's, let's try That's some really recipe. Cool. Yeah, well, again, it, it taps in. It gives you something uh, to sink your teeth into, so to speak, that's uh, outside the, the realm of just a kitchen. So that, And that's then, really you know, uh, we, did, we do food shows. Uh, ah, I see. Yeah, so uh, when I walk, so they... They bring, they bring me, they fly me to the food shows, you know, and we do the food shows and we got a chance, you know, it's always good city, you know. I got this year, I went to Chicago, I went to Las Vegas and, Fun. you know, yeah. uh, I get basically a whole expense paid trip, you know, and we go to the best restaurant. They always ask me which restaurant. Go check them out. I want to chef, do you want a restaurant, you know? Choose yeah. the wine too, you yeah, know? Yeah, again, <laughs> continuing education and professional development, that's yeah. what it's all about. And, and it's good because you see something else, you know, and sure. the idea because that's the way... In our business, if you if you don't go and look at something else, you know, always look on website. I look at Get magazine sale. and sure. see what keeping it all fresh after all these years. So I and Andre, thanks so much for stopping by the Heaping Spoonful Studios and sharing the details of your long and successful career with our listeners. I am one of the lucky folks who gets to eat your food, so I've really enjoy the chance to talk about it too hey thanks everybody for listening to heaping spoonful uh we're putting up new episodes on the first and third tuesday of each month so keep those in mind and uh, we appreciate you listening have a great rest of your day thank you we hope you enjoyed this episode of heaping spoonful on behalf of all of us at benny keith foods mid-south division please know how much we love connecting you with the legends of the culinary scene and their unique stories I look forward to the next time we can offer you another Heaping Spoonful.